Okay, well, hi everybody. And hi you guys up there, and you guys up there. How are you? Um, so I'm Terry Green Sterling, and I'm the writer in residence here at the Cronkite School. And um, we do um, a lot of narrative journalism and journalism workshops here at the Cronkite School. So this is very near and dear to my heart. Um, let's get right to it. Okay, so I'm gonna read you Fernanda's bio. Uh, Fernando, Fernanda Santos is the Phoenix Bureau Chief of the New York Times and the author of The Fireline, the story of the Granite Mountain hotshots and one of the deadliest days in American firefighting. Fernanda has reported in three languages, in Latin America and in the United States. She got her start in journalism in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, her home country, where she bore witness to violence, inequality, and immeasurable hope. In those scenes, she found her passion for telling true stories. The key to Fernanda's elegant writing is her diligent reporting. You can't write well unless you report the telling details the nuances of character, the important moments that shape our lives and define them. And if you do it well in your stories, in your news articles, in your digital reporting, if you do it very, very well, maybe your story will turn into a book. So without further ado, <laughs> please welcome the Phoenix Bureau Chief of the New York Times and author of The Fireline, my friend and colleague, <laughs> Fernanda, yeah, Fernanda Santos. <laughs> Can you hear us? Is she, is she wired? But everybody can hear, oh, yeah, I am. Okay, I hear myself now. Okay. So, so Fernanda, so we all know that journalism doesn't happen nine to five, that it can be, <laughs> it, it can happen at odd hours and um, it can be unpredictable and it can be full of twists and turns that we don't expect. So starting um, with how you first heard of the Yarnell fire, um, take us to that first moment that you heard of it and your reporting of it and um, end with your getting the contract for the book, if you can, in this first little introductory part. Well, first of all, it's great to be here. Um, I have spoken at this forum before, um, and at the time, this book was just sort of like something I was just starting to work on, and I, I wasn't quite sure I was going to make it to the end. Um, and I have an office on the third floor that I never gave away and they haven't kicked me out yet. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. I love this school. Um, well, you know, what you said is absolutely true, right? Um, journalism is not a job that's done Monday through Friday, nine to five. Um, it's not a job that actually has uh, set hours. I remember many times being ready to leave work and go home and then something happens and an editor looks around and he sees you there kind of getting ready to go, are you up? And I go, yeah. And then you're starting your shift even though it's technically the end of your shift. Um, the Yarnell Hill fire, I assume you all know about this fire. In 2013, there was a wildfire here in Arizona, in Yarnell, Arizona, um, where uh, 19 firefighters, 19 members of the same crew, the Granite Mountain Hotshots, uh, were killed. And uh, I was home, it was a Sunday, it was about six o'clock. I had um, neighbors over, we were having pizza, dinner, wine, and my husband saw it on Twitter. Um, he said, you know, there's 19 firefighters missing, presumed dead near Prescott. And I said, okay, I'm gonna pack. And I put some clothes in a bag and I got in my car. And I remember calling uh, the Avapai County Sheriff's Office because I had no idea where Yarnell was. I had in fact never heard of the town of Yarnell, Arizona. And uh, I called the sheriff's office and I knew that we had to have a story online right away. Um, so I said, well, I have 
and I don't advise it, but I have sometimes uh, driven and like typed a message, you know, you really shouldn't do that. It's not safe and I feel horrible. But sometimes on deadline, you kind of forget these things and you just want to let your editor know that you're on your way. And I, um, called the sheriff's office and I conferenced in a copy editor at the Times um, who was there sort of late because, you know, we're three hours behind New York. And I told her, um, don't say a word, just type. And I started asking the, the person I was on the phone with, this man who answered the phone at the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office, basic information about this fire. What happened? Where was this fire? Um, at what time did they lose communication with these firefighters? What do you know about the firefighters at this point? And Karen Henry in New York was typing, and um, as I'm driving to Yarnell, she basically put together a story based on the reporting that I did, but that she pulled together into a story. And back in the old days, which was the days I started in journalism, we had this system called the rewrite system. Remember, you would call someone, and you would dump your notes over the phone mostly, and then this person would put the story together and you would continue to report, because we didn't have laptops and wireless and Wi-Fi hotspots and all these things, right? And so, um, so that's how the first story came together. I ended that day on, at a parking lot. I finally got to Yarnell, I mean to Congress, which is a town next to Yarnell, and I remember asking the sheriff's office, um, if you were me, um, where would you go? Would you go to Prescott or would you go to Yarnell? And he said, well, there's nothing going on in Prescott. And I said, well, then how do I get to here now? And he said, where are you right now? And I told him, and he was very kind and told me, okay, you get on this road and you go through Wickenburg and you make a right at this other road and you're gonna hit a point where you won't be able to go any further because there's gonna be a roadblock. And I said, okay, then that's where I wanna go. And it turned out, as luck would have it, I guess, that the roadblock was by a restaurant that was full of people who had just evacuated from Yarnell. And so my first story that night, other than the, the very quick hit that we got done as I was driving there, was about the people who had left Yarnell with literally with fire on their backs, unsure of what was gonna happen to their homes, if they were gonna have a home when they went back, unsure of what was going on in their town. They could see the fire moving. Um, at the top of the mountain where Yarnell was, but they had no idea what was going on. And I found these amazing stories, as one would find in any situation like this, people who, in the heat of the moment, moment when they had to pick their most valuable items, they chose to pick their parrot and their dog, and there was a man who told, the only thing he brought was this antique car that he had painstakingly renovated over time, and that was the only thing he left with, was he hitched a trailer to his truck and he came down the mountain with his car. To him, that was the one thing he wanted to save. Um, and I wrote this story dealing with, at that point with an editor, given that it's the New York Times and it's glamorous, was in Paris. And I'm thinking, here I am in Congress, Arizona, and this guy is in Paris. And we were, you know, um, discussing this story that I was filing. Um, and uh, my night ended with my battery in the car, the battery in my car dead um, and nobody around me. And if any of you have ever been to Congress, Arizona, it is not a busy urban center. There's no coffee shop you can go to, no restaurant, no random person walking down. But on this day, there was this man. He appeared out of nowhere. He was wearing a tight shirt, I I'm not making this up, uh, camouflage pants, tucked under military boots. And he came out of the darkness and he just came my way and he said, do you need help? And have you seen that movie, like where that's the moment that the guy like chokes the girl and cuts her to pieces? And so <laughs> that's what I was thinking. He's gonna kill me right now, and nobody's gonna know because I filed my story. Who's gonna wanna? Nobody's gonna be looking for me until they need me tomorrow morning. And so it turned out this man was a veteran from the war in Afghanistan, and he had moved down from. Um, uh, was out of Washington State, which was his home state, and he was driving down um, and found out about this fire and decided to make a detour and, and go there and see what, what was doing because he was taking pictures for the army in Afghanistan. And he ended up being my guardian angel that night. He saved me, jumped, started my battery. I went back to, I went to Prescott's 
I got two hours of sleep, I guess. And How'd you get to Prescott? Did you have to go back down? Well, yeah, I had to go back all the way down the hill, back to, you know, this little winding road that leads you back to 17 and then all the way up the 17 north. So it ended up taking me two hours to get there. As a crow flies, yeah, I know in Prescott are not very far away, but it's not easy to go from one place to the other. And, uh, but yeah, but that's, you know, I got all that adrenaline. I got to the hotel, at, I don't know, three in the morning. I closed my eyes. I remember at 5.30, um, my editor calling me and saying, oh, hi, I'm sorry, it's so early, but we want to know what your plans are for today. And I was like, of course, why did I even try to sleep, you know? <laughs> but yeah, that was the story of how I started covering that fire. And um, I think I have um, the next slide. Um, Chris, can you move to the next slide? Oh, actually, that's all my social media stuff. There's more of that in the end if you guys want to follow me or whatever. But if you click on this link, you guys are going to see the first story I did. And it was a profile that I did that ran on July 1st, which was Mon Monday. Um, actually, it ran on Tuesday's paper, but it was online on Monday. It was a front page story about this crew. Um, and at that point, I only knew the name of three of the 19 men. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, um, how can I write a profile of a group of men if I only know the names of three of them and I knew very little about them, very little about the job they did? And I guess to finish the answer to your question, you were saying how this became a book. You know, every, I, to me, every great story starts with a question or a bunch of questions that you want to answer. It's sheer curiosity. Most great investigative pieces that you find started with a reporter finding something that was a little odd or out of place and wanting to find out how did that happen or not happen. Um, in my case was, you know, what are these wildfires all about? And I, I have this habit of, I have always what I call my uh, ideas book. It's like little notebooks I keep. Sometimes it's the back of my notebook and I write random things. Um, and I remember I an ended that first day of reporting, um, that Monday of reporting in Prescott, with a series of questions in my notebook. You know, And they were, what are wildfires? Um, how do wildfires burn? Who were these guys? Um, uh, what was it about this crew that was different? And those questions, I realized very quickly, required peeling many layers that I just couldn't peel with newspaper stories. Okay, so do you have um, some photos that you can I do, take yeah. Us, Chris, you, can you go to the next slide? Take I have, us through some of these stories that you wrote in these first days. When so. we get there, we'll see um, some of the pictures. Uh, I wanted you guys to, you know, the thing about a, uh, this book that I wrote, you know, of course, there was a lot of coverage on the Yarnell Hill fire, a lot of coverage by um, the Arizona Republic, of course, a lot of coverage by national and even international media, um, a lot of coverage by, you know, all sorts of publications had an interest in writing about this fire. It's not a, it's, I mean, it's really rare. This was the largest day, uh, death toll among firefighters since uh, the September 11th attacks. So it was pretty significant. And the fact that they were all from the same crew made it even more compelling. So I became very interested in finding out who these people were. This is uh, Wade Parker. Uh, the man kissing is Anthony Rose, and that's Sean Meisner. Anthony is with his fiance at the time, Tiffany, who was pregnant. And uh, Amanda Meisner was also pregnant when, uh, when Sean died. Um, Wade was engaged to be married. There were all these very personal stories that are stories that we all live, right? We all go through the experience of loving someone. Um, for those of us who uh, have children, as I do, I understood what it was like to be pregnant and to have my husband with me. And now these women didn't have their husbands with them. Um, I understood, you know, in a small way, I guess because I think you only really understand when it happens to you, what it might have been like, what it must be like to lose a child. I mean, I know what it's like to have one. And the idea of losing that child is, you know. Um, so I became really fascinated by one aspect of the story that I felt wasn't fully, um, fully formed in the stories that I was reading. And that was really the human side of it. You know, who were these men? And, and understanding who these men were, um, and that's the whole crew over there, 
uh, I could understand much better um, what this crew was about. This was the only municipal hotshot crew in the country, uh, for those of you who don't know, and I didn't know, and I think most people don't know. Hotshot crews are, by and large, federal crews. Um, so it was pretty unique to have a hotshot crew that was associated with a municipal fire department, and that was the Prescott Fire Department in the city of Prescott in Arizona. Um, Prescott is surrounded by forests, so they created this crew to basically protect the city, but also because hotshot crews are sort of top level resources, they travel throughout the country and throughout the West primarily, um, fighting wildfires as they happen. In fact, there's a Fulton fire that just started here in Arizona, and it just became a pipe one fire, that means the highest priority type of fire because it's threatening communities. So they bring teams such as hotshot crews to, to fight them because they're the ones who are trained to get closer to the fire, closest to the fire um, and, to, um, and to fight these flames um, to protect communities. But, um, you know, I really was fascinated by these guys. Like, who are these people? <laughs> you know? And what is that? Is that the tree? Yeah, so tell um, us about that tree. So the way, um, so these are the things that I'm finding out as I'm as I'm reporting the story. I'm hearing all these little tidbits of things, right? And 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 again, these things are all just making me even more curious. And as you all know, um, news stories have a shelf life. Um, you know, we're super interested in something. We are reading all about it, watching all about it on TV, hearing about it on the radio, reading on the web, however it is that you consume your news these days. Hopefully you all are consumers of news and credible news sources. Um, and, uh, uh, but I knew that there was only so much interest in the Arnelli Hill fire for the time, simply because we cover the world, right? And there's so much going on, and there's only so much uh, space that can be devoted to that, so much energy, and also, from my perspective, I am the Phoenix Bureau Chief. I cover two states, but I'm a chief of myself. Um, so I am the Bureau. <laughs> so I tell myself what to do every day. If I do a good job, I, I feel really happy. I have a glass of wine at the end of the day and I go to bed giggling. And, uh, and if I don't do what I should have done today, for example, there was one task that I wished I had fully, that I had concluded that I didn't. Um, and it's okay. I you know, I'll get up early tomorrow and I'll finish it up. Um, but, you know, I knew that I couldn't focus all my energy in this story. And I also knew that it would be somewhat of a disservice to tell this story in bits and pieces and new, in like, you know, incremental newspaper stories. So this was one of the stories that I heard that really intrigued me. This is a, an alligator juniper tree, alligator juniper, because you can see the bark looks like the skin of an alligator. Um, it's in the Prescott National Forest two weeks before the Yarnell Hill fire. There was a fire in the Prescott National Forest called the Dosi Fire. Interestingly, it was the f only fire that threat to threaten the city of Prescott since this crew had become a hotshot crew. So it was created to protect the city, but there were never any, fi any big fires that threatened the city. And a lot of people in town actually didn't really know what they were about. They were like, who are these guys anyway? What do they do? Um, as you may remember, there was a big recession. Um, Arizona suffered tremendously. There were budget cuts in all sorts of agencies. And, and for a while, a, a lot of the discussion was around cutting this crew. You know, what is it that they do? What is it that they bring when they are reimbursed for all the work they do for in other states? But anyway, um, my understanding of the job that wildland firefighters do is they remove the fuel from the forest to get the fire, to stop the fire from burning. And what is fuel in the forest is the vegetation. That's the stuff that keeps the fire going. So they build these things called fire line, hence the name of my book. Um, uh, and fire lines are essentially uh, wide trails carved in forests that are devoid of everything that burns, including roots. So they'll come with chainsaws. As you can see, Andrew Ashcraft over there has his chainsaw. There's another one here that it was probably, um, I don't know who would have one of these guys. Um, I don't see a Sawyer around here, but anyway. Uh, oh, Dustin. Um, so one of them had the other saw. So they come at the front of the line, they, they, they saw off trees, and then the guys behind them, the swampers, remove that big debris out of the way, and then the guys behind them with their hand tools, uh, like landscaping tools, really, shovels, rakes, Pulaski, which is a combination tool, 
um, that's like the main tool for wildland firefighters, remove the rest of the stuff and they clear this area of the forest. So it was really weird to me that they actually work to save this tree. Firefighters are not known for saving trees because trees burn and if trees burn the fire, it means the fire continues, right? But this is a really beautiful, huge tree that was a co-champion in the Prescott National Forest, the tied for the oldest tree in the forest. How, and how old is it? You know, it's hundreds of years old. I don't recall the exact age. It's in the book somewhere. It's a thousand. A thousand, okay. <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, imagine that. This tree has been there for a thousand years and now there's a fire going its way. So what do you do? Do you chop it off? Do you take it down so that it won't carry the flames all over the place and continue to move them and propel them toward the city of Prescott? It was really threatening um, develop, uh, developments there, you know, homes that people save their money to buy and to build. Um, or do you find a way to protect it? And so these guys were asked to protect this tree, so they, they went and they, they carved a, um, an area around the tree, a, a fire, they built sort of a, a, a defensible space around the tree, took all the vegetation out, and the next day they came back to see if it was there, and it was, so they took all these beautiful pictures, um, which it was actually the picture, this picture and others were in the camera of this man to your far left in sunglasses and that's Chris McKenzie. Um, Chris also died in the fire. They all did with the exception of Brendan and um, Chris Kimmer somehow survived the fire and Chris's dad um, gave me um, permission to use the pictures in the book. Um, and uh, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, but uh, I thought it was just this amazing story because it was so counterintuitive. And it also, to me, represented something about these guys. Mm -hmm. Like, they cared enough about the forest that was essentially their backyard to go out of their way to come up with a plan to protect this tree. And to me, it's sort of like a beautiful, you know, um, parenthesis in, in what ended up being a really tragic uh, ending for them. Right, and it's... I mean, two weeks later, they'd be dead, right? Right, two weeks later, this fire was... Uh, and, and the interesting thing, again, is that, you know, and those are the types of things that when you're writing a new story and you're sort of in a hurry on deadline, you may hear these things, but you just don't have time to pursue them because, like, gosh, I got to get this done, you know? If it's not for tomorrow, it's for Sunday. I had a story that I spent that week working on with a colleague, Jack Healy, for Sunday, and my focus sort of totally veered toward that, but... You know, these stories take time to report. You gotta talk to people, you gotta figure out who gave the order, who asked for what. Um, and there were many stories like that. There were stories about, you know, um, uh, again, Andrew Ashcraft writing a contract to his family called the Team Ashcraft Contract with, where he made 19 promises to his wife, and that was in May um, of this year, promising things like, I promise to always take out the trash. You know, I promise to love you. I promise to protect my family above all. And I'm paraphrasing him here because he was, you know, with simple words, so much more eloquent and such beautiful things he said. And, and you, in hindsight, you look back and you think, like, it's almost as if they knew that they had to leave that registered somehow. But, you know, you can't go too much into that because then it becomes sort of like a spiritual question and I'll let the reader decide. But, but those are the joys of reporting a book, I guess. That you have time to delve into the character and the moments. Right, and develop the characters. I mean, you know, I made a, I had a very difficult task with 19 people. Um, usually there are two strategies that are used when you have a lot of characters. And mo more commonly, and this is Andrew's family, Andrew, Julianne, and his four children, um, Choice, um, Tate in Julianne's hands, Shiloh, and Ryder. And Joe Wojcik in Niello and his son Kevin, Kevin was in a mountain, Eric Marsh, the superintendent, having a banquet in the forest. So they, you know, that's sort of like how they eat their food. And I love that picture. Um, but, um, the, you know, having 19 people to deal with is not an easy 19 task. main characters, really. <laughs> right. So how do you do that without, like, confusing the reader and having them go back and look? 
I think some people you didn't do some, that. You <laughs> did not do that. I mean, I read the book and I, I, I wasn't. I knew who they were and I wasn't confused. So how did you pull that off? I'm glad that I didn't confuse you. I yeah, hope how, that, how did I you pull that. it off? Well, I, you know. There are two strategies that I see that you can right. use when you have a lot of characters. And most commonly in newspapers, and I would say magazines, is you narrow your focus to a few people, maybe a hand, you know, two, three, maybe four people who you find to be representative of the whole. And through those experiences, you tell the story of the group. Um, it's, it's more contained. Um, it's, it's harder for you to mess up. Um, and it's easier for the reader to understand. But every, I met all of the families and every family that I met and every person that I met started to become real to me. It sounds crazy, but sometimes I would talk to them. I would be in certain situations and I'd be like, gosh, Garrett Zupker would love to be here with me right now because Garrett was one of those guys who loved the outdoors. He would like go out camping in Oregon, you know, on the Oregon coast and stay there. And he had a degree, a business degree from the Eller School at the University of Arizona, but he just wasn't into working in an office. Uh, and, I, and I get that, because I don't like offices either, um, which is why I love my job here. Um, I deal with my editors virtually and like, you know, at a distance. Um, but uh, I love them, but you know, uh, it's just the way I roll. But um, uh, I made a decision. I, I realized that my real character was the crew, was okay. the Granite Mountain mm -hmm. Hotshots. But the Grand Mountain Hot Shots was made up of 19 people. So instead of looking at these people as 19 separate people, I looked at them as 19 parts of one whole. For that reason, some stories and some people emerge at different parts of the book. Some of them are only mentioned right at the beginning. My first chapter is called The Guys, and, and it has a little bit about all of them. And so people get a sense of who they were, where they came from. But then, you know, way later in the book, I have a chapter where um, Danny Parker, the father of Wade Parker, who you saw in the previous picture with the big smile and the beautiful blue eyes, um, joins a group of people who go to the mountain to retrieve the bodies. They were all friends and co-worker, uh, colleagues. I mean, really close friends of the Grand Mountain Hotshots. And Danny was the father of one of them and also a firefighter, so he goes with them. And it's a really poignant story because it really represents to me not only a very close relationship between a father and a son who are both firefighters, and that's a very common story in the fire business, um, but also it represents the type of unity that that crew had. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I won't give it away because I hope you will all read the book. Uh, but, uh, you know, it really, when you read that chapter, to me, like I remember finishing that chapter, it was one of the chapters that I didn't change much because I felt like it's just right, it's just what it should be. And I kind of get a little bit in the biographical information about Wade, I go deeper into his history and, and his father's history. Um, and my editor in New York, you know, who, read, who was editing the book said, but why, you know, I don't know, we should just get this, get rid of this here. It's kind of slowing down the narrative. You know, why are we talking about Wade Parker on page 200 of this book? And I said, do not kill Wade Parker. We need Wade Parker right there. I want people to understand who he was so they can understand who his father was. Um, and then um, they can understand um, why this matters so much at this moment in time. Uh, and it's such a luxury. Um, I So many times I wrote newspaper stories and I wished I could go in on digression and talk about somebody's past, but I had to keep going because I was reaching my word limit, you know. I, what was your word limit? Was uh, I, I'm, my, my contract said 80,000 words. I came under 80,000. I maybe, I don't know, I think I, I clocked at 73,000 words and then I had a chronology that they asked me to write, which was helpful. I wished in hindsight, that I had a glossary. Is that how you pronounce it? Gloss yeah, yeah. Glossary, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, with some of the terms, I try to explain them as simply as I could. Right. But you know, it, it's, I'm sure that if, you know, and as you go on in your careers, you'll see you'll write something or you'll produce something for TV or do something for radio or online, and then you're gonna look at it the next day and you're gonna find 20 d things that you could have done better and should have done better, but you just didn't. And that's how you learn for next time. So, you know. We're still, I'm still learning too. And I said, when does that stop? Okay. <laughs> Never. Um, oh, great. Um, so, Fernanda, um, 
These people died in 2,000 degree temperatures. Um, 19 people dying together in 2,000 degree temperatures. And you had to listen to some of their last broadcasts. Did right. you, what, what was that like for you? Don't click on it just yet, because I'll cry. <laughs> it's, um, yeah. I was listening to this again today, and my husband asked me why you're listening to it, because he knew every time I listened to it. I, it was very hard. This is the, I, I brought it here because, I don't know, I thought it was important for you guys to listen to, so you understand sometimes when you're reporting, you have to put yourself in positions that are not very comfortable or not very pleasant. Um, at this point, you know, by the time I, got to the day of the fire where this happened, to the moment where they're actually gonna die. I had a very hard time because at that moment I knew families, I knew children, I knew wives, I had, you know, I was becoming friends on Facebook with some of them so I could right. see them grieving or I could see them sort of quote unquote moving on because there's no real moving on, right? You just kind of find a different way to right. live right. Um, and learn to live with that hole and that absence. Uh, and that goes for both wives and, and uh, parents, uh, just very different kind of grief, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I actually transcribe a lot of this uh, last radio communication in the book because it really shows, um, to me, it's sort of like is the epitome of the breakdown that happened that day. Um, I don't know if you guys paid a lot of attention, but there was a lot of discussion for quite some time over blame with this fire. Who is the person that we're gonna blame for the death of these 19 firefighters? Could it be the superintendent of this crew, Eric Marsh, who ulti ultimately allowed the crew to go down the mountain from an area the fire had already burned down into a canyon, which anyone who knows fire knows that fire moves up and canyon kind of funnels it up. Um, and they were on, on their way to a ranch um, that was on the edge of the town of Yarnell. So could it be him? Could it be someone who failed to, to order them to stay where they were or failed to properly notify them about the approaching storm? Who, who is the person that we're gonna blame? I mean, it's so common in our world of journalism to, to look for that. We're used to going to court and finding a verdict, guilty, not guilty, you know? It's rare that you find a hung jury. A lot of times we get so caught up on these black and white of these stories. But to me, the best stories and, and, this, and most stories really exist in the shades of gray. Mm -hmm. And so I had to accept one that blame would have to have a different meaning than the, con the different connotation than the generally negative connotation that it has. You know, when we say, oh, I'm blaming you for this, it's usually like, you know, you were wrong and what you did was not good and you should be punished for that. Um, and then you have the whole idea of, you know, okay, so then if there were a series of mistakes, then how did they happen? I think it's a much healthier and more, and more productive way to look at things. I think in general in journalism, sometimes we turn people off because we're so much into like, you know, the, the negative aspect of things. You can point out the negative without being negative, you know, you can, almost provide like a solution in your reporting or ways that people can explore that. I have to, I have to interrupt right now because, um, so what Fernanda's book does is without, without casting blame, I mean it documents the chaos and how nobody, how people were having difficulty communicating um, on all levels and it was just, chaotic and you just like, you felt you were like, you were right there in the middle of the chaos and oh my God, I know they're gonna burn up. You, I mean, the tension was phenomenal, um, but it was, it was blameless. It was really, really well done. Because I didn't feel in the end that it was fair to blame one person right, alone. Right, because it was complete chaos. Right, from it the was, very beginning, right. you know? And, and it was very interesting because, you know, and I, I'm sure you guys will come to, and maybe you have already come to these situations where you have to, you don't have real people to, to answer a lot of your questions, but you have documents. 
And in my case, I had the families, I had many other people who were very helpful and forthcoming with information and time and explanations, but I also had a trove of public documents that I literally interviewed. And I, what I found out is that these documents provide sort of like a, um, a puzzle almost that you piece together. Actually, Chris, if you can go back one slide. We've got a, we've got. Yeah, um, and then we'll play this and I'll open for Documents. questions. So I just wanna show you, you know, I, Whoops. sorry. Um, I'm a little, um, I, organization is key for any big project that you do. So, you know, and we each come up with our own uh, systems. Um, I had never written a book, so I really didn't know, and I asked my friends, and they were like, oh, you write your scenes, and you put them on a wall, and it wasn't working for me. Yeah. So in the, on June 30th, 2013, there were lots of documents, dispatch records. I love dispatch records because they have specific times stamped to every decision, right. every request, every call. And so what you see here with these post-it notes, um, different colors, I actually had a color-coded system for different types of things that all these different documents talked about. They all talked about the same thing. They talked about air attack, which are um, the airplanes that were part of the firefighting operation that can um, both spot people down there and also dump uh, chemicals on the fire. I mean, chemicals, they are proper things that are used to slow down the flames. Yeah. You also have the weather, you have the position of the crews. Right. So I color-coded all of that. And I think, uh, you can go to the next slide, Chris. I think to um, sort of end, and I really, you know, this is the last communication. The last voice you're gonna hear um, is by Eric Marsh, the superintendent of the crew, yeah. basically communicating to the people running the fire that we're, in, you know, we are uh, gonna deploy our shelters and we, he will call them when they are under the shelters and these calls never came. Um, and then I'll tell, you, uh, I'll tell you when to stop because it kind of goes. But, um, but you could, if you click on this link, there's a, it's video and audio. Um, no, um, you click on the, on the link before, sorry, yeah.
So I don't know if you heard the last, you know, we're burning around the brush. So they were burning the brush around them to create an area that there wasn't any brush to be burned and they were gonna call them when they were under the shelters. That was Eric Marsh and that's the, the, last, uh, the last time that we, you know, the last words that we heard from them. So, you know, it's, uh, these are real people to me when, I got to, you know, I remember going over and over because it was a transcript, but I didn't trust the transcript. And um, I just wanted you guys to hear it because I think it gives a good idea. There's somebody asking them to stop hollering on the radio. They don't even know, who they are. somebody else saying, is Gwen and still in there? Clearly, people, someone had lost control of, of the fire, so. So, um, gosh, okay, well this is a good place um, to end and. Chris, can you just move to the last slide? So yeah, and not talk about and have some questions. We've got 15 minutes. Um, does anybody have any questions? Please. About, about covering a tragedy like this? Hello. Hi. Um, so having a story like this is as tragic as it is, and having 19 people along with 19 families, as well as the entire um, town, at what point did you feel like you could give yourself permission to say, you know, I did these stories justice when you write a book about it? How did you come to the conclusion that you felt okay with covering something like this? Question. That's a great question. That I love that you're question. taking notes. I always took notes. It's great because we can't ever rely on remembering things. Um, that is a great question. You know, when I started talking to the families, I was determined to be fair to them. You know, in journalism, we hear a lot about balance, right? Like, oh, we gotta provide balance. And I don't quite use that word. I haven't used it in quite some time. I say that we have to strive to be fair. If you're fair, it's going to be balanced in the sense that the stories will be properly represented there. And when I was writing and when I, when I was reporting and I realized that my story was not about 19 people but about a crew and that in putting together the story of this crew, I wanted people to see these men as real people, uh, not as superhero firefighters, you know, not as some detached entity um, that we all grieved for without knowing anything about, but as, you know, husbands, um, brothers, sons, friends, firefighters, people who do very risky job. Um, you know, I have to say that I finished the book um, feeling like I had achieved that. Um, you know, every, a book is such a personal thing. You may read my book and get to the end of it and say, gosh, you know, this is, you know, I, I, I don't like this book because I come away not knowing what happened exactly. I don't have my ultimate answer or I wanted to know more about these guys. But I think that, you know, I've, for me, as, 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 a, as a writer, um, I came to the end of it thinking that there will be people who will read it and will walk away from it thinking, feeling for these families and feeling for these guys for who they were, uh, not just what they represented in sort of like the media constructed uh, persona that they became. So. I guess it was when the book came to an end, but I still cringe when I read the book. I'm now reading because I'm revising, a few, you know, little things like like a stupid mistake that I made because there's a paperback coming out and I got a, you know, my chance to fix it. And I still read and I go like, oh, I could have written this so much better, you know. Um, but but I, I felt at peace when it came to the end. And I think that that's what we all, you know, I, I, I have yet to meet a journalist who, who gets to the end of a story and says, I did the best story out there. And I'm talking about Pulitzer Prize winning people who say, you know, if they had a chance to do the story again, they would do a better job with it or they would have done something differently about it, you know? So I think what you have to always look for is to be fair to the story, to be fair to people. In a book, you can let your heart guide you much more than you can let in a newspaper, but you don't have to remove yourself emotionally from every story that you get, that you do. At least that's what I believe in. I think that's what distinguishes one writer from another is how much of them is in that story. So I hope I answered the yeah, question. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
Um, he hello, Fernanda. Um, Hi. I am Dave Marino. I'm a senior at the Cronkite School. Um, I enjoy your writing a lot, Thank and you. I've enjoyed this uh, presentation here today. I actually had a question about a piece that you wrote um, about a year ago. It's called um, Students uh, Hurl uh, uh, Insults and Litter at Mosque in Tucson. Yeah. So I really enjoyed that piece, and I was wondering what you would recommend um, in, terms of t in terms of doing articles about more at-risk groups for discrimination in America. I've always had a thing for the underdog, and in some ways I felt like Grand Mountain was the underdog because they were, you know, kind of um, pushed over by the town of Prescott. You know, they wanted to cut money. Um, they were sort of looked down upon by other hotshot, federal hotshot crews in the country. And in some ways, the, the people in the mosques that you talk about were sort of like the underdogs. I mean, um, this story was uh, in Tucson. Uh, they built a lot of student housing. I mean, they're private uh, rental apartments but right around a mosque that had been there for quite some time. And you know, kids, they go Saturday night, have a few drinks, and they toss the beer cans and the bottles over the balcony. Um, but it seemed like it was very much on purpose. They were throwing things at this mosque parking lot. Um, and it became interesting to me, you know, because it represents the stories of the times do also, we always like look for ways that they are relevant, that the stories are relevant to people all over the country, all over the world. And in that case, it represented a conflict that's so real these days, right? I mean, in New York, based on what happened yesterday, here we are again talking about Muslims and their acceptance in this country. There's a narrative in the presidential election that has to do with that. And in this case, it was just another opportunity to bring that up. So that's sort of like my approach. It wasn't so much to defend somebody or condemn somebody else. It was more to bring to light something that was happening that resonated with a sort of a national discussion about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello. Good evening. Um, I'm Breely McClelland, and um, I was just wondering how, what, at what point did these articles and you keeping updating these stories from the fire turn into something that you wanted to write into a book, or was it somebody else that told you, you know, you should, you should turn this story into something that people can remember these nights? Yeah, I forgot to talk about that, right? So, yeah. Yeah, at what point did that, like, Thanks for the question. Turn into so it was very early on, I was writing, um, I think it was right after this profile that I showed you guys ran, I got um, emails from uh, some um, literary agents um, who, you know, it happens once in a while, it had happened to me once before, I mean, they see a, a good story, they know that it's a story that lends itself to a book. I work for the New York Times, so there's sort of like a, an immediate recognition, built-in audience with that author, even though I had never written a book before. Um, so, you know, as I said earlier, because I, my curiosity was not satisfied by the stories that I was doing and the space that I knew I would have or not have in the Times, given the cyclical nature of news, um, I decided to call one of these. Uh, you know, I talked to a couple of them, and there was one that I really liked. And my criteria was pretty basic. It was like, can I have a beer with this guy? Is this somebody I want to like hang out with? Because I knew that he would be someone that I would have to have on my side, that I would have to have a lot of interaction with, I'd have to spend time talking to. And the last thing that I wanted to be stuck with some person that I just couldn't stand, and you know, or who was so different than me that I couldn't. I didn't have anything in common other than a common interest of like selling the book proposal to a publisher and having it published. Um, and so it was kind of like somebody came to me and said that, but the, the real ultimate decision came from my husband, interestingly, because I kept going home and talking about this story <laughs> obsessively. Um, and my husband is a saint and he would just indulge me and listen to me, but then his patience started, you know, like running short. And then at some point he said, you know what? you should just write this book. Because if you don't write this book, in 10 years, you're gonna sit at the dining room table and you're gonna be lamenting the fact that you didn't write it and it's gonna stay with you forever, he knows me. And I said, okay, so I then realized that not only did I wanna write the book, but that I had my family on board too, you know? So that's how the, the book came together. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, first of all, just thank you so much for coming and talking to us. It's a real pleasure and an honor to have oh, you. Thank you. And um, my question is, as journalists, we cover so many heartbreaking stories and we talk to people who are having one of the worst days of their lives. Right. And as up and coming journalists, uh, what advice would you give to talking to people who oh, are having so much heartbreak? That's such a great question. Thank you for this question. Never, ever, ever say, I know how you feel. 
Because even you feel lost your child, or if you lost your husband, or if you lost your parent, and you're talking to someone who just lost a child, or a husband, or a parent, or a best friend, or whatever, um, grief is very personal, and everybody goes through the grieving process very differently. So, you know, I heard that from someone I was interviewing for a story a long time ago. I worked for a newspaper in Massachusetts called the Eagle Tribune, and it was a car crash where someone had lost a son. And I think this woman, you know, she knew that I asked, I said that with the best of intentions, sort of like, I don't know what to say anymore to you, so I know how you feel. And she said, no, you don't know how I feel, and don't say that, because, you know, it, it kind of makes me mad after you've been so nice all along. Like, don't ever say that again to anybody you interview. <laughs> and she, was, she gave me one of the most valuable pieces of advice I've ever received in my career. It is so true, you're gonna deal with so much of that, dealing with people at their worst moments, and some people are gonna slam the door in your face, tell you, tell you to F off and get the S out of here, or get the F out of here, <laughs> And, you know, whatever curse, if they're cursing other languages, it might well be S, but, um, uh, you know, <laughs> um, and they may curse in other languages, who knows, but, um, but you will have a lot of people who will talk to you, and it's strange to think that people will want to talk to strangers, but it's also very cathartic for them, and I think in some ways re a relief to be able to talk about something so personal with somebody who's not emotionally involved. Um, so that's like my biggest piece of advice. And always let the person talk, you know, and give a little bit, uh, the last thing is give a little bit of yourself to people. Let people understand that you are, all, you are a human being, that you're not just a, you know, a, 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 a gutless journalist knocking on their door at their worst moment trying to get a sound bite out of them um, so you can go on with your story, you know. Um, because we care, right? We go home and we think about it. I remember, as I'm speaking, I have a slideshow in my head, and uh, people and families I met and stories I covered that I that stayed with me because they were incredibly difficult and traumatic. But you know, um, yeah, you know, just be yourself, be human, show that you're a human being, and don't ever say that you know how it feels because you just don't. You know. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we um, we will. We'll take these two. We'll take these I'll be two. quick. Yeah. We yeah. And, and I'll hang out. I'll hang out a little bit, and you guys can ask questions, okay, if you have other questions. My husband's putting the baby to bed tonight, so I, it's all right. Hi, how are you? Hi, good. I'm Sam said thank you so much for coming. Um, now that the New York Times is, like, such a big news agency that everybody knows of, now they only have one person <laughs> to represent Phoenix. How did you awesome. Get, how did you get there? Because just, I, <laughs> I imagine it's pretty competitive. How did I get this job? Yeah. Um, well... It is and it isn't, you know, getting, being a national correspondent or a foreign correspondent, I think national is even, depending, well, I wouldn't say that. I think both foreign and national require a willingness to move, to uproot your family and your life and go someplace different and start all over again. Um, in my case, I had a two-year-old when we came here in 2012. My husband, who had a, a pretty good job in New York, we owned an apartment. We, that couldn't be rented, so we had to sell. So we had to decide on a lot of things. But, you know, I'm not from this country. I'm originally from Brazil. So I have always seen these opportunities as a chance to really understand what America is about, you know. And I think that the West and the Southwest are so much more what this country is about than, when, than New York. New York is almost like mm -hmm. a different planet, you know. Mm -hmm. And I really was curious about it. And I think that editors are kind of looking for people who are, as I said, willing to move are not going to be two years later like, oh, well, I want to go back to New York, you know. But, and also curious about going someplace different. You need to have this sort of like wonderment about it, you know, so that you can see things that maybe everybody else has seen and make them interesting even for the people who are seeing them every day. And I'll give you a silly example, not so silly because it's like kind of almost too obvious. I wrote a little thing about a meteorologist in Phoenix, uh, Matt Pace from Channel 12. I picked him because he is a great, he's great on Twitter and his tweets always made me laugh. But the whole story was 400 words about how many ways do you find to say it's hot in Arizona and this, in Phoenix in the summer, <laughs> you know? And it was, it was just like, and he even struggled with it and it was really a funny story and it it like really for people here even they were like oh my gosh I use this word and that when like people got engaged with it because 
they never really thought about it, even though we think about it every day in the summer because it's so damn hot out there, right? <laughs> um, so, um, so I guess, you know, what I'm trying to say is that it is competitive on one hand, but, but it, it's, there's a very specific type of people who work for these kind of jobs and people who don't. Um, and I think I was just one of those people. I'm very restless. I really love going to new places. Uh, and meeting new people and living different experiences and having this sort of like outsider, I feel like a balloon like floating over <laughs> and, you know, but also I have a kid, so I'm kind of part right. of the community, you know, my daughter goes to school, we go to church, so you kind of, you know, so you have this like hybrid role, which I think is a great way to, to get this part of the country translated to people who don't live here. Awesome, thanks so much. Yeah, and you make it matter, you're the last one. Hi. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Um, oh, okay. So after this very emotional experience of writing your book and kind of uncovering the humanity behind such a tragedy rather than um, an account of just what had occurred, how do you feel now when you write articles or newspaper stories that take more away from that sentimental and compassion, compassionate um, perspective, but instead adopt a more objective and informative Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, oh, so many great questions. I love it. There's hope for this world. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it was a real struggle when I first went back to writing news stories because I wanted to keep on peeling the layers of in, in every story that I went to. And I would take so long to write my leads because I, I, I was in that habit of not being in a hurry to tell the story. Um, but that's the job that we do, right? So what I try to do is I, I look for a balance. Since I'm in charge of covering Arizona and New Mexico, which are like Mars and Venus, um, and since my responsibilities span really the whole gamut of news stories, I can write about education, politics, I can buy, write human interest stories, I can buy funny stories about meteorologists. You know, I can write anything and everything, crime, whatever, as long as it's it fits sort of the type of stories that we print in the Times or that we run on the web, um, then I can really um, look for that one story that, pro that kind of comforts, gives my heart the comfort that it needs, that I can report with my heart first, you know? And then I can go and heart, write a hard-hitting piece about, as I had on Monday's paper, so today's paper, um, because it came online yesterday, so to me it's like all confused now, but um, about a trial of two police officers that started in Albuquerque, New Mexico today. You know, they killed a homeless man, a mentally disabled, mentally ill a homeless man in 2014, and so it's a very straightforward story. There's not a lot of heart there, uh, regardless of how you feel about it, you know? But then I'm also working on this other story that will come out before the elections that really allows me to use my heart and some of my sensitivities to guide my interviews and my reporting. So, you know, it's just look for a balance. You kind of like trick your editor and you give them like a list and go, I'm gonna do this one first, oh, and then I'm gonna do this one, you know, and then, then your heart is always fulfilled. Because that's what matters. Ultimately, this is not a job that's going to pay you a lot of money. For the most part, we're not going to be, you know, there are the exceptions. But I think the rule is that, you know, we, we should hopefully we'll all make a comfortable living, but nothing that's going to make you super rich. But it's a job that makes me really happy, you know. I really love this job, even in the hardest times. And I hope you guys learn to love it and appreciate the importance of doing this job and really sort of... Um, being, you know, and feeling like you're ambassadors, you're really translating the world to, it could be your neighborhood, it could be really the world, you know, um, and if it's online these days, it is the world, it's however people get to it, so, yeah. So it was a great question to end it. Yeah. Thank so well, thank much. you so much. So, okay, so, um, so Fernanda has her books for sale, and honestly, you guys, <laughs> I mean, it's like, not the, her. it's like the Titanic, right? I mean, you know how it's going to end, but you just keep turning the page because it's so amazingly written and reported. Um, so after, so then you can hang out with them after you Yeah, sell. I can after hang you, out, yep. After you sell the book. Yes. Right? Uh, get that. My super assistant, a graduate of Cronkite, Rebecca Zemanski, who's right there. Raise your hand. Rebecca, I hired her. She, I could never pay her enough. Rebecca transcribed every single interview I did, more than 100 hours of interviews. She went to Prescott with me, to the archives. She was my 
my supporter, my friend. She cried reading the interviews. She was great in so many ways that she won't even know. And so she also helps me sell books because uh, it's through changing hands, but they're awesome. They give me a square. So anyway, thank you all so much. Thank, thank you, thank Terry. You. <laughs> I'm really happy. Thank you. Thank you, Facebook.